friends, whoa, what an exciting day we've had. It's hard to believe that in my own ministry, I've led more than 20 Easter worship services in all sorts of different places. I was reminiscing this morning when I was up on Port Huron that, yes, we had outdoor worship services there too in the sunrise, and half the time it snowed, and it, it never gets old. For me, this monumental day that we celebrate together, this resurrection of the dead, I never get tired of it because it is the most consequential, wonderful, the most incredible thing to ever happen to humanity. And the fact that we get to celebrate it, that we get to live into it, that our lives are transformed because of it, what a joyful thing this is. I think also part of what makes it so joyful is this journey that we've been on to get here, that we've made our way through Genesis during Lent. What a journey that was. Then on Friday, we spent a sobering hour at the foot of the cross on Good Friday. Our hearts were broken. And then we add in everything else that's been happening in the world, in our lives, and it feels like we are due for some good news. Our souls need it. Our minds need the rest. And that's today. Today is this day of celebration. Today is the day of the Lord. Today is the day that we come and are gathered and are renewed. And that we celebrate, in fact, that death has lost its sting. As we celebrate today, we're going to be going through the Gospel of Mark. We began with Mark last Sunday with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we continued that journey through Mark as Jesus was arrested and as he died. And now we are going to complete the story that Mark tells us. Now with Mark 16, 1 through 8. I invite you, if you're willing and able, to stand with me together. If you are able, let us do so together as God's people. Let us read aloud this great word that God has given to us, starting in verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting at the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for this word today. There's so much going on in this text, this passage. So many emotions wrapped up in this one amazing event. And Lord, help us today to go on this journey with these women as they approach the tomb. Help us to see what they saw. Help us to hear what they heard. And fill our hearts with joy as we once more hear the news that you have risen. Help me, Lord, today to speak your words. May your spirit be upon me as I teach from this text with words of truth, words of joy. Together, Lord, give us the ears to hear, the minds to understand what you would have us so that we may be faithful as your disciples. And we pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. 
One thing that I really love about the Gospel of Mark is just how practical he is. There's not any extra details. There's nothing fluffing it up. We're, we're missing out on so much that the other Gospels tell us about. Here in the Gospel of Mark, it's just, it is what it is. It's as simple as that. These women, they encounter the tomb, and they are alarmed. They're astonished. They're bewildered. Because, of course, they would be. Any one of us would be. It's a natural response. What happens when we encounter something we don't expect? Do we handle that very well? Not normally. It takes us a while to get our hearts and our heads wrapped around something that is out of the ordinary, something that we don't expect. Sometimes we see things and we don't, our brain can't make an understanding of it. And that's what's happening here. Now, the other Gospels fortunately reveal that the women eventually recovered from their fear, that they did tell the disciples what they saw, but it is so real to know that they go to the tomb and it's entirely discombobulating. It was the last thing that they expected. The text does reveal to us what was really going through their minds, the minds of Mary and Mary and Salome as they approached the tomb. It wasn't a mystical thing. It wasn't hope upon hope. But just this practical thought of how in the world would they get to the body of Jesus with the tomb sealed up the way it was, with the stone, a very large stone, rolled in front of this entrance, (coughs) The text tells us that prior to uh, that day, in fact, at the end of Sabbath, which was the night before, they had gone, all, gotten all the spices, and they were ready to anoint Jesus, as was the Jewish custom. But that fear was just so practical. God, how are we going to do this? How is this going to happen? How are we going to get to him when there is something in our way? The stone that they are describing in the text there sat in front of this entrance, and it was this very large, heavy stone. It was four or five feet tall. In the front of the tomb, historically, what they have found as they have excavated these tombs is that there would be a groove that would be carved into the entrance so that you can push the stone into it so that it would settle into it very easily enough, but all the more difficult to get out. If you've ever gotten yourself, let's say, stuck in a deep rut or in a ditch somehow, and your car didn't work anymore, and you had to push it out, you know how hard it is to work against gravity. Working with gravity, man, that's great. Working against gravity, that's something else entirely. No wonder they are worried about this stone. It was perplexing. They didn't have an answer, and yet, what happens? Are they stuck at home? No. No. They go to the tomb anyway, even though they didn't know how it was going to work out. And I love this detail from the gospel. It's not really necessary to the story of the resurrection, but it does show us this deep faith and the dedication that these women possessed. It had only been a few days since Jesus' body had been laid in the tomb after the crucifixion. How awful it must have been on that Friday afternoon as they went to the tomb saw his body laid in there. The stone rolled across it, rolled into the groove, closing Jesus off from his community. And yet, with hearts still heavy from grief, with unanswered questions lingering on their minds, where do we find them on their way to the tomb? What great faith these women have in the Gospels. Their dedication, it still inspires us, doesn't it? And I think the Gospels make this particular point of having women being the first ones to discover the truth. If you read every single Gospel account, it is the women who are the first to know, the first to see, the first to tell. They are the first to understand what's going on. In that world at that time, in this society, they didn't even trust women to tell the truth in court under oath. But here in the Gospels, women are trusted. 
The fact that women would be the first to witness the resurrection tells us everything we need to know about how the kingdom of God operates and how it is so consistent with the message that Jesus preached over and over again. Who else could be at the tomb that morning? Jesus was always elevating those who other people didn't trust, whose society ground underfoot, whether it was women or the blind or the deaf, outcasts. And after all, who were the first people to show up at his birth? Shepherds. It was women who supported Jesus through thick and thin. It was they who supported his ministry financially. And we as Gentiles, we have also been lifted up. We have received this great gift from God. What a lesson Easter morning teaches us about how God works. And that if we're going to get on board with God's kingdom... We need to change the way we think about things. If God lifts up people that are on the bottom of the heap, what does that tell us about who we are meant to be? So that morning, these women, they show up, faith on their sleeves, approaching the tomb, these questioning upon their minds, somehow trusting that it was going to work out. And what do they find? They look up and they see that the stone's been rolled away. Jesus' body is gone, and there sits a man in white who tells them this most amazing, alarming news they had ever heard. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, as if to say you're in the right place. You haven't gone to the wrong tomb. And he was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. Come and see the place where they have laid him. Friends, this is the news that has changed the world ever since. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, the story would have a different ending. If the stone had not been rolled away, the women would have gone to the tomb that day, seen the stone, and gone home. If the tomb was not empty, then our worship today, our gathering, it would be all but impossible. The stories, the teachings, the so-called miracles of Jesus would be at best a relic from ancient history. If someone had even thought of writing down such a story with such a terrible, disappointing ending, it would have been the worst selling story of all time. Because we die. It's tragic. But it's not groundbreaking. Frankly, there's a good chance that we never even would have heard of Jesus or his disciples if He had done nothing to distinguish himself. The resurrection makes him one of one. This act changed the world. The fact that we are here today, gathered for worship, is proof that the resurrection happened. The church exists because Jesus is risen. Without it, we wouldn't even know each other. Without it, the world would be so different, we wouldn't even recognize it. What else could have transformed sorrow into joy or that morning into dancing? There'd be no reason to continue to gather together over a dead body. There was no reason at all to create a movement around what people knew to be a lie. The joy and the courage that we see from the disciples after that day, they show us something so radical happened that they were willing to give their lives for it. And as descendants of those first disciples, we continue to show the world the resurrection really did happen every time we meet, every time we serve, every time we worship, every time we lift up those who Jesus lifts up. But it's not just enough to know that the tomb was empty that day and that Jesus came back from the dead. Those are facts. Now look, those are good facts. That's good information for us to chew on, but knowing facts alone doesn't really change anything. Just because I know a lot of facts about baseball doesn't make me good at baseball or a good baseball player, does it? We need something more than just facts. And so what does this man in white, this probable angel, tell them? Go meet Jesus. We need to meet Jesus like those first disciples met him in Galilee. Merely believing in God is far different than being changed by that belief because we are told that even the demons believe in God, but they shudder. We celebrate. 
In the Gospels, we have all these post-resurrection appearances in the upper room, on the Sea of Galilee, in Emmaus. For 40 days, Jesus appears to believers, showing them, hey, I'm alive. It wasn't just enough for people to hear about the resurrection. They needed to see him. And it's the same for us. Following the rules of a religion don't really change us that much. Well, they tell us what to do and not to do, and either we do it or we don't do it. But we're created for more. We are created for someone more. And that someone, friends, that's the resurrected Christ. Just like those first disciples, we too are invited to come and see so that we can know him, that we can meet him for ourselves, because he transforms us, and that's what we need. Otherwise, Jesus is just the name of a man who we've read about in a book that just sits on our shelves. If all we just know is about Jesus, but we don't meet him for ourselves, then what changes? Does anything at all? It's not enough to even love the idea of Jesus or like his teachings. We need to know him. We all know famous people. You've probably met famous people before. It's hard to get away from the stories in the newspapers or on the news. Maybe you've been in the same room as a famous person. Maybe you've gotten their signature, and maybe you've even shaken their hand. But does that mean you know them? Does it mean that they know you? Does it mean you've been transformed by knowing that famous person? I remember one time I was at a wedding where Joel McHale, an actor, he was a groomsman at the wedding. And I knew the bride, so I didn't really get to meet him. And after dinner, I saw him dancing on the floor. And, you know, that was pretty cool. But it was nothing else than, like, hey, I, I saw this famous person once. I can't say that I knew him or that uh, he knew me at all, just because we were there together, just because I know his name. Another time at my church in Seattle, President Bill Clinton came to worship. I was there. It was, it was pretty neat. I saw him walk in the sanctuary. I, I saw him sit in the front row. I'm glad I didn't have to preach that morning. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't meet him. A friend of mine actually shook his hand on the way out the door. But does knowing a name, even a famous person's name, does that change us? No, of course not. We all know the name of Jesus. We know about him. But if we don't actually meet him and spend time with him and get to know him, and see what he loves, and follow him, who cares what information we have? If we only know about the resurrection, then our lives remain the same. And so how does this work? To meet Jesus and to know him? How can his resurrection continue to transform our lives today? Well, it's simple. To live as though he is still resurrected. To live as though he's real, because he is. He's the most real human who ever lived. We are to live with the resurrection always in our mind, to always be asking ourselves, if Jesus can come back from the dead, what sort of things might he be able to do in our lives? How we meet him is to treat him like our best friend, to go to him for advice, to seek his encouragement, to trust that he's always with us. And best of all, to find freedom in the forgiveness that he offers and then to seek to live that abundant life that he freely gives. Where would any of us be without forgiveness? Where would we be without the restoration of relationships? It's one thing to recognize that we've all made mistakes and we've all hurt people, and I know we have. We've said things that we wished we could immediately take back too late. We have always fallen, and we've not always taken a stand for the things we believe. But what God specializes in is the restoration of relationships. To God, restoring us is more important than punishing us. And proof of that is Peter. Notice that this man in white says, go tell the disciples and Peter. He singles Peter out. Because who needs forgiveness the most in that moment? Who needs the most assurance, the most grace, the most restoration? Well, it was Peter. He had crashed and burned. He didn't take a stand. He fell apart when he had a moment. He hit the hardest. What sorrow Peter must have felt after the death of Jesus, what regret he must have had. And so what did he need? He needed restoration. Only God could offer him forgiveness. Only God could redeem him. 
Only God knew that that moment of failure would help him to grow into the kind of leader that he could become, becoming the rock in which the church was built. The angel mentions Peter to help us to know that when we fall, when we fail, the forgiveness and restoration that God offers to us is a chance for us to begin anew. This, friends, is more proof of the resurrection. Peter, once forgiven, once restored, he charters this brand new life because he met the risen Lord. So did all the other disciples, all the other people that followed him. Their lives were restored and renewed. Peter, once rough around the edges, pretty angry, became joyful and loving. His transformation happened when he went to Galilee and saw Jesus. He was embraced by his Savior. So can we see this happening to us today on this Easter? Hey, God knows all our secrets. God knows all our brokenness and all our sorrows. God knows all our failures. And he offers us grace. He says, come to me so that you can be restored, so that you can be set free, so that you can live abundant life. That's what Easter is about. That unlike the women, we have the rest of the story. We no longer have to be bewildered and terrified. We can be filled with joy and a relief on a day like this. Jesus is risen. He's come back from the dead, and he wants to meet us. So today, once more, let's meet him so that we can be changed. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this great gift of life you've given us, for the resurrection. Hallelujah. Thank you for your love for this astonishing news, which never gets old, because we always need it. Thank you for being with us, for calling us to your side, for forgiving us and renewing us every day. And we pray this in your name.